complicated set of ways that's worked into the basic law, which is effectively the Constitution. Uh, well, that's a law. You know, that organization, incidentally, you can give tax-free donations to in the United States. Uh, it's the only country in the world where American citizens can give tax-free donations to a sheer racist law, you know, a regime that's quite extreme. And you can do it because nobody knows about it. You know. And again, it's not a big secret. That law that I quoted is from 1953. There's been plenty of time to find out about it. Uh, the uh, uh, there's a law in the state of Israel called an anti-racist law, of all things, uh, which says that no political party um, can run uh, if it rejects the principle that Israel is the sovereign state of the Jewish people in Israel and the diaspora, not the state of its citizens. You can't run if you object to that. It's called an anti-racist law. It's kind of curious. Uh, because it also had a provision in it to bar uh, the American uh, neo-Nazi rabbi Kahana from running. He was, they wanted him out of the political system, in fact, out of the country because of his advocacy of the Nuremberg Laws, Hitler's Nuremberg Laws, and other such activities, and the thing was framed to bar him, but as a kind of a sop to the other side, they added the provision I just quoted. Uh, and if we proceed, there's very strong persecution of Christians and, in fact, just non-Jews. In fact, also, Amer you know, Amer most American Jews don't fit their condition of orthodoxy. So there is, there is a serious, and we could go on, but there's a serious apartheid problem inside Israel. And, in fact, it's leading to a very serious set of conflicts. Uh, there's something almost like a civil war brewing over issues of this kind, partly over the power of the extreme religious group, but is a serious conflict because most of these laws were instituted by the secular labor, you know, socialist element. And in fact, you want to look at some of the ironies. Uh, this land law that I mentioned is now being challenged by the far right. Uh, so uh, Ariel Sharon, who I mentioned, and the Netanyahu government, they want to privatize land, okay, in line with their right-wing ideology. Privatizing land will mean breaking down this whole system of laws established by the secular left socialist element, which have as one of their consequences barring non-Jews from land. You know. So the situation has many complicated convolutions when you look into it, but there's, there is a serious apartheid-type problem inside Israel. It's not the same one that they had inside South Africa, but you know has it similarities. Uh, as to the, uh, to the extent that the territories are analogous to the Bantu stands, yeah, which is more or less, it's in progress, it's not in existence. So like they haven't yet set up the Bantu stands. It's kind of like South Africa around 1960, you know. Uh, but to the extent that that analogy is correct, uh, it was overcome in South Africa. This, I mean, in South Africa, it was never even an issue. So like the African National Congress, you read their literature, they never even talked about the Bantu stands. They regarded them so ridiculous, they didn't want to discuss them. Uh, the, so the, the analog to what Israel's doing in the occupied territories was virtually not an issue. I mean, like a sentence about it and saying, yeah, nonsense. Uh, because the struggle against apartheid was going on in the whole country without any differentiation between the Bantu stands and the rest of the country. Well, that's not the same in Israel there. It's going on to the extent that it's going on at all, uh, in at least in any militant fashion, only in the territories, that is, the future Bantu stands. Other things are happening in the country, but not that. Uh, so the analogies are not precise, but they're sort of there, if you think about them, and you can learn from them. Anyway, going back to your first and crucial question, how was it overcome in South Africa? Well, in a complicated fashion. Uh, for one thing, the pa world power never strongly supported the apartheid regime. So the United States, if the United States had supported the apartheid regime in the around 1960, the same way it supports Israel, that would have been a genuine peace process too. And here, you know, American liberals would have been talking about it as the peace process, and we've been talking about how saintly it is, and so on and so forth. But international business and the South African business and the United States were not really happy with it. They didn't think this is going to be a useful settlement that will enable them to extract the resources of South Africa and get rich and do the important things. So the United States was kind of ambivalent about it. Didn't support it, didn't oppose it. You know, if it had worked, the U.S. wouldn't have objected, but it wasn't going to support it. 
Uh, and the same was true of uh, international, you know, the state system and the crucially transnational business generally. They never liked it. So, for example, IBM and those big companies really didn't mind the Sullivan Laws. I mean, they, as far as they were concerned, they could pull out and wait for a couple of black managers in there and then they go back in because uh, they don't care. You know, I mean, capitalism is basically not racist. It's just as happy to exploit anybody. Uh, you can, uh, if it be women or blacks or robots or Chinese or whatever, uh, as long as you can exploit them, really doesn't matter. They're all just interchangeable atoms. Uh, so there was no inherent reason to maintain racism, uh, and it was a bother. You know, it was interfering with business. It was uh, blowing the place up and so on. So there was there were no ex powerful external pressures to maintain the apartheid system. Now the U.S. did support it. But it supported it as ways of, say, you know, maintaining Mobutu in power and uh, killing Lumumba and murdering a lot of people in Angola and that sort of business. They used South African mercenaries for that. Uh, so that, in that sense, the U.S. supported it. But it wasn't really supporting apartheid. It was just support. It was just supporting part of its kind of international terror network, which needed South Africa. Uh, the uh, uh, so that's one factor. In, uh, in contrast, the United States is strongly supporting, in fact, is implementing uh, the more or less comparable thing in, uh, in the Israel-Palestine region. Another crucial difference is that there was plenty of opposition to apartheid inside the white society, uh, very powerful opposition and very courageous and honorable people. So, you know, the blacks who fought apartheid, they really suffered, I mean you know, years and years of prison and torture and exile and getting murdered and so on and so forth. But whites suffered too. I mean, plenty of them did oppose it and opposed it strongly and on principle too. It wasn't just out of, you know, because they wanted to make more money. So there was a principled opposition within the white society, uh, the ruling society, to the whole apartheid system, not just to the Bantu stands. Again, even like the white, you know, sort of human rights people, whatever you call them. Uh, they weren't talking about the Bantu stands either. They also considered them too ludicrous to discuss. Uh, but uh, they wanted to dismantle the whole apartheid system within the society, and that made a big difference. Uh, there's nothing really comparable to that in the Israel-Palestine case. And uh, I should say a large part of the fault lies on the PLO in this case. Uh, I also, in Israel and Palestine, gave a talk at Beers 8, the... Uh, Palestinian University, and I talk about that. I mean, my, on the assumption that uh, wherever you talk, you should say the thing that people least want to hear. Otherwise, there's not much point about it. So, talking at Beers 8, I mostly talked about the Palestinians and what they have failed to do, which is very significant. Uh, it's the only third world movement I've ever had anything to do with in my life. You know, there have been a lot of them that never saw the point of. Uh, establishing links inside the oppressor society, either inside Israel or, for that matter, inside the United States. So they did nothing to support a solidarity movement here, which would have been extremely easy, in my opinion. Uh, there have been efforts to try to change this for years and years and never got anywhere. Uh, and that's a major failure, and I think Palestinians have to think about it and learn from it. But, you know, our problems are, there are other things we have to think about and learn. Anyhow, that's one difference, because there was a... Uh, you know, there was a strong movement inside South Africa of whites and, you know, so-called colored. I hate to use the, it's their term, and they still use it, so I'll use it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, colored there means a different right, yeah. So like, you know, so it's like melee or something. Yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody hates it, but they use it. So the this whole mixture of things, there w there was a you know, there was a lot of solidarity internal to them, and they were really fighting together. And that made a big difference. Uh, that's uh, nothing, you know, that we don't know about from our own history. Uh, so there are, you know, there are differences, but there are also lessons, plenty of them. Uh, and I think you sh one should pay attention to them. The floor is now open for your questions and comments. And right, if you could work with the microphone. Acknowledging uh, your point that uh, all significant power is being exercised by the United States and Israel. Do you see any uh, interests that are self-interests for the 
United States or for Israel, either politically or socially or economically, that would suggest that it's in their long, in the long term benefit of either of those countries to change its behavior in any significant way? Right. Yeah, I, I think that's a very crucial question, but I think it ought to be rephrased. Uh, whenever you talk about the interest of a country, you're already off track. Uh, countries don't have interest. No. So are there? Yeah. People. Uh, well, corporate interest. Uh, well, as a matter, see, actually, that's complex too. So, for example, uh, is uh, thanks. Uh, the forces behind the denationalization of land in Israel are coming from the right-wing business community. Uh, they don't want the internal racist system because it keeps the land nationalized. You know, and they want it privatized, which means they want rich people to have it. Okay, And they don't really care that much if some of the rich people happen to be Palestinians or Christians or something like that. It's not going to happen much anyway because of the power system. Just like it's not happening much in South Africa, I should say, because the power system mostly remains, you know, little changes. Uh, so as far as American corporate interests are concerned, it's quite compl it's in very intriguing. It's an unusual case in American foreign policy. I mean, if we drop all this nonsense about nobility and saintliness and try to figure out what's happening, uh, usually it's the case that major corporate sectors dominate the parts of foreign policy that are related to their interests. Like they may not care about other things that aren't related to their interests. Uh, the government, on the other hand, use typically reflects a kind of a more general interest of the whole corporate system as a whole. That's why the Secretary of State usually comes from some uh, law firm, you know, Sullivan and Cromwell or something, or, you know, Dulles and Atchison and those guys. Uh, those are guys who represent the general interests of the corporate sector, not some parochial interest like, you know, an oil company or something like that. Uh, but, uh, it, but where the, a sector of the, you know, power system, private power system, has an interest in some region, they usually determine what happens there. So, like the oil companies have had enormous have had enormous effect over um, you know, State Department and so on. Uh, now, in this case, it's interesting. The oil companies have not won out. So, when that conflict took place that I mentioned in 1971, that crucial one, as to whether to maintain, to keep, whether the United States should stay within the international consensus and continue to call for Israeli withdrawal, or whether it should shift to support. Israeli expansion and withdraw from the international consensus, the oil companies were on the side of uh, the international consensus. Uh, they thought the United States should keep its policy and then they called for Israeli withdrawal. Uh, and in fact, um, their representative in this conflict was William Rogers, Secretary of State, who come as a background in oil interests. Uh, Kissinger was coming from another sector, a real sector of American power, but a different one. Uh, the military system, the military industries, uh, the whole strategic analysis system that was trying to uh, maintain Israel as part of, uh, you know, part of the system of control of the um, oil region by force. Uh, th this was, remember, the time at which what was called the Nixon Doctrine was being formulated. Uh, the idea of the Nixon Doctrine was that the United States no longer was no, no longer in a position after the Vietnam War and so on to intervene massively everywhere in the world. So we had to delegate responsibility. Uh, we had to have what the Defense Department called local cops on the beat, who would run the local region under, you know, police headquarters stays in Washington, but they do the local job. Uh, now in the Middle East, there's a big job to be done. In fact, the intervention forces and so on have mostly been directed against the Middle East, always, because that's a crucial interest. Uh, the interest is ensuring that the profits from oil flow to the United States and England, primarily the United States, uh, and not to the people of the region. That's a difficult thing to maintain, like, you know, like people in the slums of Cairo can't seem to get it through their heads that the wealth of uh, the oil producers should come to, to New York, you know, <laughs> not to the slums of Cairo. Uh, and the same with people in Saudi Arabia and, you know, all over the place. 
Uh, so it's been necessary to keep beating them over the head, you know, because they have these funny ideas. Uh, and in order to beat them over the head, uh, you need regional enforcers. And the U.S. has a network of them, uh, typically non-Arab. Uh, so Turkey, uh, Israel, Iran when it was under the Shah, Pakistan. You know, that's kind of like a network of regional gendarmes who maintain what's called stability, meaning the wealth comes here and nobody bothers our local managers. That's the name for that is stability. Uh, and Israel played a role in that system, powerful role. Uh, it won that. It spurs really in 1967 uh, when it smashed Nasser. Well, there was a kind of like a war going on between Nasser and Saudi Arabia and the Yemen. Uh, and Nasser represented what they call radical Arab nationalism, meaning independent nationalism, which said we want to run our own lives and resources and so on. And the Saudi Arabian government is just, a, you know, it's not a government. It's a family dictatorship, which uh, was what the British used to call an Arab facade uh, that manages the place under British rule. Uh, and they, got, they were being threatened. Uh, by the radical nationalist currents spearheaded by Nasser, even inside Saudi Arabia. And Israel put an end to that by wiping out Nasser and eliminating you know, the major Arab states and so on. And they won a lot of points for that. Uh, it happened again in 1970, uh, at the time of Black September, when Israel intervened to prevent the potential Syrian support for Palestinians who were being killed off by the Jordanians, uh, the U.S.-British ally. Uh, and uh, the, the issue really at the time was, well, do we go along with the local interests of the oil companies who are perfectly happy to see a Palestinian state or, you know, Israeli withdrawal, they don't really care. They just want to do their business and make their money. Uh, or do we go along with a big strategic conception of how to maintain the kind of control which, in fact, they think will ultimately be in the interest of the oil corporations too? And that's a debatable point, you know. I mean, if you forget all moral considerations, you forget that human beings matter, and you enter into the world of actual political choices as made, then it's debatable. You know, it's not obvious which way to go, and you can understand why there's a conflict. Uh, since that time, the conflict remained. So if you read, say, you know, mobile corporation ads uh, in the New York Times and so on, they're rather dovish, you know, on this issue. So they don't... If the U.S. had been willing to go along, for example, in 1976, the Security Council debated a resolution calling for a two-state settlement, in, incorporating UN 242, but saying Palestinian state. It was supported by the entire world, you know. It was supported by uh, Europe, by the non-aligned countries, by the Arab states, by the PLO, you know, everybody. Uh, Israel opposed it, the United States vetoed it. But the oil companies would have gone along with it, quite happily, in fact. Uh, however, they lost out in that conflict. Uh, and so it remains. I mean, it's an intricate issue in American politics. My own feeling is that if the population has had almost no role in this, it's just not been a political issue. Uh, so, uh, and part of the reason the population has no role is they haven't got a clue as to what's going on. You know? I mean, virtually nobody uh, has any idea how much aid the United States is giving to Israel. And even fewer people know that the aid to the oil monarchs is even greater. So the aid, the U.S., the U.S. taxpayers, what U.S. taxpayers have paid to the Arab facade, the oil monarchies that run, you know, make sure that the profits come here, at least, you know, as long as anybody was counting, it dwarfed what went to Israel. But nobody knows that either, you know. Uh, it was done through various tax shenanigans. Uh, the, uh, and the, the things that I've been talking about, about the diplomacy, are virtually unknown. I mean, even the official U.S. policy, say, of the Baker administration is unknown. You, know, you only know it if you read some you know, marginal literature or you look up actual original documents. Uh, since all the stuff is kind of out of the public arena, the public plays no role. Uh, and if it did, I suspect uh, there could be a shift in American policy. Uh, as in the case of South Africa. Uh, the anti-apartheid movement made a big difference. Uh, there, isn't a, there couldn't have been an anti-apartheid movement if nobody knew there was any apartheid. Yeah. Uh, so so it's, a, it, it's a complex issue. I don't think there's a simple answer. I, I think the, uh, here the intellectual establishment, the people we live among, you know, have a 
a lot of responsibility for what happened. They're the ones who are keeping it quiet. I have three questions, and I think it's important as far as the peace process goes. The first one is, will Israel pull out of Lebanon? That's number one. Number two, uh, Israel plans on building a dam on a river by the Golan Heights. The previous administration was going to put it several miles below the Golan Heights. This administration, under Ariel Sharon, is planning on putting it a few miles north. And the last, which I think is the most important thing to mention, is you think that the split in the Israeli Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox uh, religion of converts is going to affect uh, their support of the people uh, that are not ultra-Orthodox in this country and have any effect? Uh, well, on, the, on Israel and Lebanon, uh, there is a UN resolution uh, from March 1978, uh, which actually the U.S. voted for, uh, calling on Israel to leave Lebanon immediately and unconditionally. Okay, that was March 1978. Well, they haven't left immediately or unconditionally, and the reason is the U.S. tells them, forget it. You know, you can stay there, and we'll keep paying you to stay there. Uh, that uh, and that'll change when the U.S. decides it's time for them to leave. You know. Uh, now, it's possible that they may decide on their own because it's becoming very costly. There's no, there's no strategic point in staying there. You know, they're not, by now, it's kind of, uh, kind of a policy that's feeding on itself. You know. uh, there's no threat that anybody knows of to northern Israel. In fact, the threat is mostly coming from their being there. Uh, so, for example, up until 1992, from, from the, from the, before the, uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon came after there had been nothing, uh, a year of what's called in the scholarly literature quiet on the Lebanese border, meaning nothing coming south but plenty of things going north. Like Israel was bombing like mad all over the place and killing all sorts of people, but there was no nothing going from north to south, so that's called quiet on the Lebanese border. Uh, and uh, then Israel invaded, and then it became not quiet. Uh, but even then, after the invasion, until I think it was in March or so, 1992, not a single rocket went, or anything else, not a pistol was shot across the border. Uh, what happened at that time was that the Rabin government assassinated uh, a Lebanese cleric uh, uh, and his family uh, you know, in a car, and after that, attacks started coming. And if you look at the record closely, you'll find that there are rockets, you know, uh, Katusha rockets and so on, going from north to south to the northern settlements, but almost invariably uh, in response to some Israeli action against civilians somewhere in Lebanon. They go on all the time. Um, mostly they're not even reported or they get a few lines and so on. Uh, and by now the thing is feeding on itself. I mean, Israel has a mercenary army in the south which runs the southern region by sheer terror, uh, and they just don't want to leave them, and they've, you know, complicated things. Uh, but they don't really have all that much, uh, you know, the, the interests that lie behind it are not overwhelming, and in fact it's costing Israel a lot of uh, soldiers now. They're getting, uh, you know, they're not able to handle the uh, resistance, uh, which is killing a lot of Israeli soldiers. Uh, and they may just pull out for that reason. In fact, the, one of the people who's calling for a pullout is the same um, Ariel Sharon. Uh, Sharon, the ultra-right general who sort of led the invasion of Lebanon, is now saying, look, it's ridiculous, let's get out. Uh, so they might leave on their own, or if the United States decides that they're going to leave, they'll leave. You know, if the U.S. decides it's... I'm Mark Brzezinski, your host for this weekly program, Mideast Realities, and thank you for watching. If you too are concerned about the situation in today's Middle East and about U.S. policies toward that crucial region of the world, and if you'd like to meet like-minded persons, why don't you come to one of our weekly social meetings? I'll be there, of course. Just give us a call for details.